Welcome to this joint conversation between me, Kate MacDonald, Handheld Press, and Lucinda Gosling of the Mary Evans Picture Library. We're going to be talking about book covers because a lawful lot of the Handheld Press book covers come from Mary Evans. So what we're going to do is just go through the book covers and we're going to start with Ernest Brahma, What Might Have Been. Now, this was our first book and it was our first cover. And honestly, I can't remember why I went to Mary Evans. Have you got any idea? Did I do know? know. I do know. Oh, we, good. Got, Tell me. we got to know each other on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then I came and gave a paper at your conference at Reading you University. You did, yes. And talked good. about the ILN archive specifically mm. as part of Mary Evans and showed a lot of pictures. And, you know, I've... I share pictures on Twitter and things. So I think it, somehow I'd obviously um, <laughs> <laughs> managed to ma make a, a small impression, which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that was like, OK. So I obviously got in touch with you and said, we have this book. Um, here's my new company and it has no books yet. We're looking for a cover which involves a typewriter, an Edwardian office. And I was also interested in flying machines. And I had been looking at the British Library um, picture library for mm. flying machines but they were all far too old or far too complicated so I came to you looking for a typewriter and you brought me typewriters yeah yeah and I, I thought what was really interesting about this picture is I think you said you've used this on your bag as well you know your yes. sort of giveaway yeah. bag mm. I, I mean this picture is actually taken from a Royal Barlock typewriter advert mm -hmm. from 1900 and what's really interesting about it is it's showing the hallmarks of graphic design at the time in where, you know, there were there was a real love affair with the artistic poster yeah. and it was becoming much more, posters bec were becoming much more graphic and simplistic. And this is wonderful contrast of colours, you know, very simple colour palettes that all these poster artists were using. And that sort of style was being replicated across marketing so it's being used for an advert like that you know and I, I don't know who the artist is and actually the illustration itself is a little bit crude and naive isn't it, mm, it is. I I quite like that I think it makes it a bit offbeat a bit edgy. yeah and there's something odd about there's no border to the man's jacket because the back of his jacket's all black it just bleeds into the black background which is quite disconcerting if you focus on that but the yeah. woman, yeah, the woman's head is the focus because it's got this um, nimbus of light because it's important that her hair doesn't disappear. Otherwise, she's just this ghostly face. No, absolutely. Yeah. But it, it, no, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it works, doesn't it? It does. And it's so good. I mean, as you said, we, when we started to think about doing tote bags, we were looking what picture, what covers have we got that will work on a tote bag? And our designer said, well, it has to be the Brahma or it has to be the Rose Macaulay whatnot, because they've only yeah. got three colours. Yeah. And it just and it worked really well. But in the end, we used up 100 tote bags and thought these are actually environmentally unfriendly. So we didn't do any more. So they're collector's editions. Anyone there who's got are. one. I don't think even we've got one left. So, but, yeah, you know, so but, but, but what sort of, you know, attracted you to that picture is what attracted the Edwardian public to those, you know, pictures mm. it had to be seen from afar, and yeah, uh, you know, they often only had could print in two colours because of you that's know. true. Yeah, and for a newspaper ad, you want a real high contrast. It could be yeah. just caught, catch your eyes, you flick past, and it's it's such a. I mean, the woman in the centre with a typewriter at the time that was a pretty modern in, image. Yeah, it's new technology, and for women actually doing the typing, that was also new. For this period because when the typewriter was invented in the 1890s or thereabouts it was men men were doing the physical typewriting so women were typewriting clerks and then they were the typists so that's how the word evolved as well yeah well i suppose that's um an instance of advertising wanting to you know be ahead of mm -hmm. the crowd and showing themselves to be modern yeah and tapping into yeah what people were, were doing yeah, I mean, it's just it's just one of those about. many hundreds and thousands of pieces of ephemera we've got at Mary Evans that yeah. sometimes finds its way <laughs> to being the perfect yeah, and it's, it's, it's a good strong image and it's yeah. still selling, which is really nice and good. it's a top novel. Okay, let's move on to the next one, which is a pair. We've got two Arthur Rackham covers. We've got yeah. Sylvia Townsend Warner, Kingdoms of Elfin, and we also used Arthur Rackham for 
not the sequel, but another collection of her fantasy stories of cats and elfins. Now, when I was putting this book together, First Kingdoms of Elfin, it came out about a year earlier than Cats and Elfins, I wanted fairies on the cover because the book is about fairies. But I didn't want Peely Wally stupid um, girly little girl pictures with pink and butterflies yeah. and flowers. I really wanted something darker and a lot more edgier because that's what these stories are about. And I think I searched myself in the um, Mary Evans website because it's really good for searching. Anyone can go in and just start rootling around keywords, see what comes up. And to my amazement, this picture by Arthur Rackham came up and I, I didn't even know he did fairies because I'm used to his slightly more whimsical images. Yeah, uh, well, you know, if you want sort of spooky, dark, exquisitely drawn fantasy, he's he's the master, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, Mary Evans Picture Library, he, he's actually out of copyright now, but for many years we represented his mm -hmm. estate and, and still obviously have a large collection of images by him. Um, and I think it was interesting, I think you said to me before that uh, Sylvia Townsend Warner would have probably would. you know, yeah. grown up with that. And, and, and The Midsummer Night's Dream, that, that was published in 1908. So what, that would sort of work out about... Yes, it would. I mean, she would have been early teens, I think, then. I forget her date. So she would have known the images. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. And she, she did write something whimsical about fairies in 1926. That was almost one of her first publications. It was a, an essay about where Elfendom came from or the kingdom of Elfendom. And then she went on in 1920, in the same year, to write Lolly Willows, which was about witches, right. and then didn't come back to fantasy until 1970. So there was a 50 year gap. Yeah. Um, but still, I mean, Rackham, it, it works really well. Um, and we got Neil Gaiman to endorse it, which was oh, just astonishing, having yeah. an email from Neil Gaiman arriving on a Saturday morning. Duh. Fantastic. Well, I imagine he, I would imagine he's an Arthur Rackham fan. I think so. Yeah. And he, he's about 10 years older than me, I think. So like me, he would have grown up reading Elf Kingdoms of Elfin. So yeah. through a, a mutual friend, we, you know, he was delighted it was coming back. So to have Arthur Rackham on one, then we needed when we brought out the second Warner collection to have Arthur Rackham on the second. And this one, I wanted someone emerging from the water because one of the stories in this collection, which is like the other random fantasy short fiction that Warner wrote that I managed to track down, there's one about a dryad, um, a woman who turns into a tree. And I wanted something to reflect a really quite disturbing female figure in amongst nature. And then we have this picture of Undine by Rackham, which isn't strictly from the it's not really reflected in the stories but the mood certainly is can you tell us more about this undine picture What's, what um, is it I, I can't i don't know very much about it at all actually um i mean rackham was pr principally um you know he was published in very expensive well you know expensive gift books which were incredibly popular around the turn of the cent well towards the end of the uh, 19th century and into the early 20th century so mm -hmm. when we talk about um sylvia townsend water seeing it you know you would have to be from a family that could afford those sort of books yeah because oh, yeah. they would have tipped in plates um mm -hmm. published an expensive three or four color process um as opposed to a more affordable kind of picture book that might have been printed by lithographs yeah um so you know um what mary and hillary did was assembled and collected a large number of those golden age mm -hmm. books by illustrators and uh and rackham naturally took his place among yeah. them and his spookiness um made him slightly stand apart from other illustrators who he was a contemporary of um uh, you know, as you know, I've been researching and writing about John Hassel recently, and I found a letter by Rackham in the oh. Hassel archives. To, and what it, he'd been requested if he could submit a picture mm -hmm. to um, the Society of Humorists and exhibition. Oh, and Rackham <laughs> very politely declined, saying he didn't think he had anything funny. <laughs> oh. and, and, 
Yeah, I know. So, you know, this sort of this spookiness sort of using, um, you know, taking on themes from quite dark themes and mythological subjects was definitely what he did best. And, yeah. Uh, and I mean, strange. probably the most lighthearted stuff is the Pickwick Papers and things like yeah. that. But generally speaking, and he was he was kindly mocked for that by mm. a lot of the other illustrators who to whom humour came much more easily. Yes, yeah. You can see it in the in the Kingdoms of Elfin cover, there's some strange little miniature fairies at the bottom, which you see, oh yeah, this is the Rackham I'm familiar with, like the like the uh, the flower fairies type. Yeah. Which I, I see, because when I was growing up, I completely missed the dark and spooky Rackham. I obviously wasn't exposed to that kind of work. Um, so yes, it does not come as a surprise that he couldn't really do comedy. I mean, I think Heath Robinson, no, Arthur Rackham and Heath Robinson, no, just not, not going to work. Anyway, very, very suitable for Good. Sylvia Townsend Warner stories. The next one is completely different. It is yeah. Zelda Fitzgerald, Save Me the Waltz. Um, so I, I had not read this novel when I said we're going to publish it, which was the first and last time I've done that. But I took it on good faith from an academic colleague that this was absolutely superb and it was out of print and she was coming out of copyright. So I thought, yes, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. And then I read it on holiday and was completely transfixed because it's a superb novel. It's fantastic. And after I'd read it, I was very aware that this was part of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Jazz Age, Ernest Hemingway writers drinking a great deal in Paris in the south of France and also New York. I knew all about that. I wanted the cover to do reflect something completely different, which was what the book is about, which is the, the narrative voice, her artistic development as a dancer, um, which is reflected in Zelda's own life. So I wanted a yeah, dancer yeah. from the night. Well, it was strange. The book is 1930s, but it's depicting a 1920s society. So that was a little awkward. Which one do I go for? And I remember you supplied me with a lot of really beautiful watercolors of dancers in atelier and studios in sort of um, practice clothing at the bar and they were good but they just looked like adverts for dance shoes yeah and I wanted yeah. a dancer so we went for a photograph and this is the first photograph we used do you can you tell us about the image where it comes from well the image comes from one of our um you know we represent a number of collections of vintage stock photography mm -hmm. so you know there have been picture libraries for a long long time going back to the 20s and 30s and we have collections from various places like that and that's where that picture comes from so mm. you know somebody some photographer coming up with ideas for stock photographs in 1935 or wherever you know got a model to pose like that well and, not just a model but a ballerina I mean that, that uh, woman yeah. is holding and, absolutely you know, perfect stance I, I think the choice of that is rather nice because it's not obvious, but what it's doing is it's summing up the spirit of the book, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And the freedom and the, the physical abandon, but also the physical control, the training to stand like that on point with, with that garment and in the wind because it's been yeah. blown about. It's, yeah, it's an astonishing photograph when you think about the logistics. Of how, and is she standing on the edge of a building? Because it looks a little bit precarious. I don't know. It's I don't great, know either, but I, I think, you know, sometimes we get, these collections come to us and they get put onto the website and sometimes there's sort of tens of thousands of pictures and we don't get a chance mm. to look through them. And, and, you know, in any sort of, I mean, it would take hours to go through them. Um, and you have to rely on the keywords. And you found this picture, didn't you? you know, I think so, yeah. I mean, I think when, when you... what it's really lovely working with you because I know you're quite keen to have a route around our website mm -hmm. and you're getting to understand its uh, strengths and its foibles and things but if you get a bit stuck you'll come back to me and I might toss a few ideas at you and you do every time you always I, produce a winner when I get stuck it's fabulous <laughs> well I try my best um, and that, that is what you know that is what we do we obviously try and make our website very you know sort of user friendly um we are sometimes a victim to the keywords we've been supplied with mm -hmm. but obviously this one came up for you yeah and it was it's good and it also yeah. gave us an i mean we could choose the tint we use so we went for a subtle lime green which works really well yeah it is a very satisfying cover and to our great joy at the end of last year the very well-known film star emma roberts featured it in her instagram 
and it had 1.2 million views and we're doing rather well with sales on the back of that. That is incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. It's a blue. I mean, who knew? I mean, I know this edition because when this when we brought this out at the beginning of 19, 2019, I was convinced that lots of American publishers would be bringing out Zelda works because she yeah. was out of copyright yeah. and nobody did. So we have this very small British publisher supplying a really important modernist text about, you know, 1920s Americana to American colleges and they're all buying it in for their college courses, which may be why Emma Roberts found it because it was in a yeah. bookshop on the, on the stacks. So lucky us. So the next one, Rose McCauley, yeah. what not? Yeah, I'm so proud of this book. This was our first bestseller. Um, and I discovered it because I've done a lot of academic research on Macaulay and I rediscovered this novel, which is her 1919 <laughs> speculative novel, um, which because Macaulay also wrote about many other things, it kind of got forgotten for a number of reasons. One of which is because um, is about three pages in this novel and the original is 1918, not 1919 were potentially libelous. So when the publisher saw it in print, he said, no, we got to pull this back. So it was pulled. She had to write three pages of blah to cover up potentially libelous text. And then it was re-released and it plummeted. It just didn't do well. And she didn't really mention it much. Um, and it's because it's not like anything else she ever wrote. It's not mentioned in the studies by, of her. And an awful lot of people like to focus on her wit, on her, her Second World War books, on the, 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 the 1930s struggles of women and, and, and gender and identity and that kind of thing. They don't want to look at eugenics and end of the First World War. Anyway, so I rediscovered this book. I was so keen and I needed a picture that reflected the media. It had to be about journalism because journalism is a really important thing. And I wanted a woman and a man dancing or embracing or in conversation. And that was a tough brief because how could, yeah, you showed me lots and lots of graphic images and photographs of a woman and a man in a train carriage, in a restaurant, and they just looked dull. They were like reportage. It didn't have oomph. And then you pulled this one out and it's this couple looking at a crossword puzzle. But you don't really see that because it's just a newspaper to us, but originally. Yeah. It was a cartoon laughing at the crossword puzzle. Well, it's really, you know, this picture is really interesting because at the time in the 1920s, the crossword was completely taking hold mm -hmm. in the UK and there was a huge craze for it. And the illustrated magazines, the ones that we have in our archive, picked up on it and mm -hmm. used it as a theme quite a lot, you know, for... Um, satirical and, and humorous pictures and this is what these magazines did I mean when I'm talking I'm talking about the bystander the sketch the tattler tattler is mm. the only one obviously which still exists in some form today although quite different um but they're you know they were stuffed with humorous pictures you don't get that in you know sort of magazines in the, the same way and this one is by Reginald Higgins now mm. Reginald Higgins I don't think he's a very well known name anymore but actually he's probably mm. better known as a uh, he did a lot of travel posters mm -hmm. so if you you know if you google him you will find some real stunners by him uh, i was even looking this morning uh, at a fantastic saint andrews golf um oh, uh, yeah. poster which he did mm -hmm. uh, around the same time as that picture actually um mid 1920s and um Oh, I think it sold for about nine thousand pounds. So there you are, a, you know, a very able posterist. But yeah. all these, you know, he also did a lot of stuff for these magazines, and he specialised in depicting the modern girl, mm. often looking very androgynous. He liked to do jokes about girls getting eaten crops, or uh, about wearing trousers, and you know, being. Uh, you know, being the one who wears the trousers, smoking that sort of thing, and mm. yet, you know, uh, it was slightly um humorous slightly mocking but also slightly admiring so mm. this picture is completely you know a sort of beautiful snapshot of the mid 1920s of you know what modern young people were getting up to so yeah. i kind of you know that's and and again the colors oh that perfect. Was sort of necessarily they were printed in those two colors red and black and gray yeah. and um but that works again in a, mm. from, from a graphic point of view yeah and it's a gorgeous dress I mean, yeah. there's some beautiful descriptions of clothes in the books, um, in, in the novel, and 
that one is not depicted, but it should have been because it's a cracker. It's a beautiful garment. And it just reflects the mood of the novel perfectly. And it's, it, it's just a brilliant match. And when the book went ballistic, because The Guardian wrote an article about, published an article about it in December 2018. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I sold 80 copies in one day just through our website. Wow. And the bookshops are going, we want the book. And it wasn't published for two more, three more months. So I had to reprint it twice. So this book's done really well. And I think the cover is so, so much part of that because it, oh, it's just so attractive. And for a very long time, this was our bestseller um, because it just does well. It's yeah. great, yeah. really good book. Right, the next one, uh, back to the photographs. This is- Oh gosh, I love this picture. I the love Elizabeth this picture. Elizabeth von Arnhem, the caravanners, yes. yeah. Um, the novel is a terrific satire um, in the voice of a Prussian baron who goes to England on a holiday with his second and much younger wife, and what could possibly go wrong? Because they're going to share a horse-drawn caravan, well, there'll be four or five horse-drawn caravans going around Kent in August. And he is the most obnoxious individual on the planet. And his wife begins to learn why. And I wanted something that would reflect a woman going, hmm. And I didn't expect to find a photograph, but you presented me with this archive. So tell us about the archive. Well, the, it's the Boswell collection, isn't it? Which is part of, um, you know, bizarrely, we represent the archives of Bexley Council. Mm -hmm. um, now you think, oh, do I really want an archive which is full of pictures of Bexley? Well, it's not really. I mean, it could be anywhere in the country. Yeah. It's just a wonderful, wonderful snapshot of late 19th to sort of uh, maybe up to the Second World War mm -hmm. society. Now the Boswell collection, within that uh, um this this chap was he called henry boswell i can't remember henry anyway he was an amateur photographer and a collector of lantern slides now the lantern slides are interesting but it's actually his own photographs mm. which are the most and he took pictures of his own family and some of them show interiors of houses and it's just an ordinary middle class family and that picture that you chose i mean when we saw that before you know before you chose it, it was like that is stunning. Yeah. I mean, it's it's candid. It's it's um, you know it's evocative. It's the fact she's she has this really casual pose for an Edwardian yeah. lady. Her, no one yeah. sees an Edwardian woman with her arms up like I know. this. And you've got the blouse. You've got the little pearl pin holding the collar. You've got all the details. She's got a string of beads. She's leaning against a window. You can see the lace curtain. She's got a bracelet. There's no makeup. Her face no. is natural as the day she was born although pretty likely her hair is in the edwardian puffed up style oh, it's just fantastic it is it's an absolutely beautiful picture and a really good example of how you know we represent some very well-known photographers as well but then you've got this collection which was just some mm. guy in yeah. bexley um collecting pictures indulging in a bit of amateur photography and um you know building up his own little collection using mm -hmm. his family as models and that's the result yeah that's is, you know that's a very sort of transporting picture isn't it yeah um, and it's edelgard okay. it's edelgard um the the prussian baron's wife the yeah. baroness thinking huh how am i going to manage this awful man i seem to have married <laughs> looking at the yeah. Oh, it's just tremendous. Yeah, so that was another book. No, I, I was so delighted when you chose that. Um, <laughs> I, I just think it's yeah. a beautiful shot. It's a cracker, yeah. Yeah. And now yeah. we have our current bestseller. Yes. Jane yes. Oliver. And Stafford, as you know, I love it. As usual. Yeah. Um, so this novel is another one I discovered. I found it in a book sale. I read it on the way home in the train from London and I nearly missed my stop. It was <laughs> that good. It's full of illustrations. Um, if I can find them. Yeah. Oh, find them there. there's Look, one. There's yeah, there's one. Yeah, there's yeah, one. And yeah, there's... I love that as well. Yeah. Oh, trying to find it. Oh, there's another one. Yeah. There's yeah, one. there, there so, you go. So, yeah, scanning the illustrations, that was a bit of a palaver, but the cover. So, it's about working in the books department of a department store, which is pretty obviously Selfridges on Oxford Street. And it's about a young woman and her, the foibles, and she gets a job, even though she can't type, she can barely count. She's a librarian by trade. She's perfectly yeah. well educated. She went to Oxford, but you know, retail, that's a bit new to her. And it's about the ups and downs and her manageress is dreadful. And, but the manager is rather yummy. 
and living on her own as a single woman in London, not earning very much, counting the pennies. And at home in Edinburgh, she's got a very disapproving fiance who's no support whatsoever and supportive parents who are in the background. So I wanted something about modern 1930s society, which, I mean, the book is all about living in London in the 30s. And I really wanted a department store. And you went to the Morris owner. You went to a car magazine, which rather threw yeah. me, but come yeah. on a picture. Well, you know, these car <laughs> magazines at the time, they're obviously trying to sell a lifestyle. They're mm -hmm. trying to reflect um, the aspirations of the time yeah. and also you know quite interestingly a lot of these car sort of adverts and magazines were also um, appealing to women at the time so you know if you look at that image which is by an artist called Shufri who I know nothing about at all <laughs> um, but I think did a few covers for the Morris owner mm. but it's, it's got everything you need there there is a, 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 a 1930s modern shop front so yeah. obviously it's not Selfridges, which is a couple of decades earlier, but it, it, it has like the, it looks like the right Spencer's, feel for yeah. it. It's, mm. it's busy. You can, you can imagine um, the heroine of that book kind of in amongst those people, busy as a way to work or from work or going yeah. out for her lunch and, you know, wondering what she can buy for not very yeah. much money. And, and I just, I, you know, it, it completely looks like Oxford Street. And the other nice thing is that um, it's got by British across that shop. Yeah. Front. And mm. at the time, that was uh, in you know, 1932 when that uh, cover was published. That was a big thing. You know, it was mm. a, a big government push yeah, uh, to yeah. get the population to buy British. Um, and it's just wonderful. It's also just a really lovely, sort of cheery, colourful picture it as is. well. It's, it's consumerism rampant, but that's yes. delightful. And it's got these wonderful fashions. You've got the woman in the short fur coat when her long, elegant 30s mar maroon dress. And there's a page boy behind her in the uniform of that shop or a neighbouring one. And it looks like he's carrying her parcels yeah. because they're crossing the road to their Daimler. Yeah. And then you've got an, a couple with small children, one carrying a balloon. You've got another couple. You've got the colours. Everybody is wearing such beautiful colours. So we had a hard time choosing which one for the back. But we went, there's a woman in a yellow dress at the back and we went for a yellow Selfridges back, which is really good because a yellow spine shows up on the bookshelves it's yeah. very easy to spot yeah. yeah this is our bestseller it's just been walking off the shelves we keep reprinting and reprinting and reprinting it's fabulous and the cover uh, i i ad i adored this book and you know <laughs> for, i i have such an interest in um you know women's lives during this mm. time i just thought, thought it was absolutely perfect yeah you know, it, it was it gives you details doesn't it that you you can't really pick up from anything else yeah exactly and what to do yeah you know, how to clean your your satin dance slippers when they've been yeah. spoiled you put petrol yeah. on them and oops they've gone up in flames because you left them <laughs> to dry too near the fire I know, I know. Yeah, a, 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 a shoe leather sort of, um, you know, wearing down all the time. Just these little kind of personal details yeah. that you just wouldn't, don't even think about. No, no, it's it's a wonderful book. Yeah, yeah. Right, slightly more serious. Um, a little later last year, we published another Rose Macaulay, Non Competence and Others. Yeah, um, which is a novel. Non-Competence and Others, 1916, about pacifism in the war, and then all her 30s and 40s anti-war writing, of which there was a lot, because it's she was a columnist for various magazines, like The Spectator, New Statesman, The Listener, and then in the war itself, she wrote a short story, which was a kind of processing what happened when her flat got bombed and she lost everything she owned, down to the letters um, from her lover who was at that moment dying of cancer. Um, oh. It's a devastating story. So this book I put together because I wanted to showcase her anti-war writing because she was a pretty fervent pacifist. And I cannot now remember what, how we found this image, but it's difficult to look for pacifism as a keyword. It's a hard it, one to search for. It is. I, I can't remember. Do you know if you found it or I found it or, or you know, I, I can't I, remember that either. I, I, re I suspect you did because, honestly, it was a huge surprise to me when I saw it. Um, maybe I, I think I might have done. I, I mean, yeah. we have, um, as well as, you know, a, a lots of runs of British periodicals at the library, we've also got quite a number of French, German, Spanish and uh, mm -hmm. on some other countries. Um, Mary and Hillary, who founded the library, were collecting 
you know, I suppose from the late 50s onwards, the library mm. started in 1964. And I, I think it's really incredible that they were finding these things and keeping them and preserving them. So this cartoon comes from a German satirical magazine mm. called Simplicissimus uh, by an artist called Olaf Goldbranson, who I, I have to admit I don't know very much about, but it's from 1917. And um, I give talks quite a lot and I've, I've written on First World War cartoons, British ones. Uh, but what I do in my talks is I will show a selection of European cartoonists as well, because the style really, really contrasts with British mm -hmm. cartoonists. I'm not yeah. saying one is better than another. It's just very interesting to look it's at it. It's a different cultural, cultural Com niche, Completely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the, the um, German, particularly the French ones, much more savage, bold, mm. filling up the page, um, sometimes you know giving readers quite unsettling imagery which is mm -hmm. sort of what you've got with this picture isn't it with those walls it is. yeah it um, is it's quite chilling yeah yeah, and, and, yeah and, and, but it's also the the beautiful metaphor of you've got the peace angel perched yeah. on a very precarious and quite low tree surrounded by the walls of war and it says everything you need to know about the state of pacifism yeah and the need for peace at that point in the war yeah um it's brilliant absolutely brilliant and the colors are beautiful as well the very very pale aquamarine instead of white which is yeah it, it's just a, a gorgeous image and it punches it yeah. gets the hit that's needed for this book yeah well, you know and it's from 1917 so it's almost it, date wise it's contemporary absolutely yeah. contemporary yeah and i what and i really like the fact that it doesn't have any figures of military in there there are no soldiers um so you're not attacking the soldiers who are out there dying you yeah. are attacking war itself the people yeah. who engender and make war happen rather yeah. than it's, it's very conceptual isn't it but it is yeah it, it works but, extremely well yes so that that's hmm. a very good one at yeah. the same time we also published another rose macaulay potterism yeah from 1920 which is a, a satire on on journalism, it uses anti-Semitism to a really powerful degree. Um, it's a mar and this was Rose Macaulay's first bestseller, and it came out immediately after Whatnot. Another reason why Whatnot was overshadowed. Mm. And I wanted something to showcase the lead character, who is a quite appalling young woman who wants what she can't get, and she sets out to get it. And it's a very feminist book because in the ninety area. In the First World War and in the very early end of the war, very early 1920s, women had new freedoms. Women had these things they could do, but they still had to fight for them. And my goodness, does this young woman fight for what she wants? Um, and I won't give the plot away, but she's wicked. So I wanted a wicked woman. And you gave me a hair slide, which was so much fun. Yeah, I mean, this <laughs> this image comes from an advert for a decorative hair comb. Yeah. From the French fashion magazine, Art Goutte Beauté. I never know whether I'm pronouncing that right. Mm -hmm. Art Style Beauty, 1924. Mm -hmm. This was a very beautiful um, magazine with uh, pochoir printed plates, which had intensive colour saturation, mm -hmm. really great quality. So um, people always talk about Gazette de Monton, but Art Goutte Beauté is sort of another really you know one that stands up and it's another example where mary and hillary you know they had homes in france so they collected oh, there and they would have picked this up probably for you know a song comparatively in the 1960s and now yeah. if you try and buy one of these well you know no, good luck possible. good luck to you so mm -hmm. they're, they're they're fantastic things to have and you know what what you've done is you've just taken that image and in a way projected a certain personality and you could and when you talk about the um the lead character in this book what do you think well it's a beautiful stylized chic slightly off-center illustration but she's also got a little bit of a wicked sort of smoke oh, on her yes. face hasn't she yeah <laughs> she's gonna get what she wants and she's also got dark hair that was the final touch because the character yeah. has dark hair ah right and perfect. perfect what it was exactly what i wanted yeah and i i had to tussle with um sarah lonsdale who wrote the introduction because she wasn't sure this was right she wanted a different image of something a little more soulful. I think she felt more positively towards Jane, the lead character, than I did. But Nadja, our designer, and I agreed this one was absolutely stunning. This is going to catch people's eyes when it's on the table in the bookshop. Um, because you want to know, ooh, striking image, who is that woman? What's it about? We didn't want well, something more. 
you know, it's interesting. It poses the question: if you buy a book, or how influenced are you by the cover before you start reading the book, and how will it shape mm. what you think about that character? I, I will put books down if the covers don't appeal. If there's yeah. something on the cover I don't like, or it makes me think, "Oh no," I will put the book down. I won't even go into it. It's for me a cover is essential. It has to sell the book. It has to give me an idea of what the book's about, and the mood, the style, the period, the theme, everything. Some some of that has to appear in the cover. Um, yes, so that's why. Well, I, I think you've done idea. something very, you know, very interesting with handheld books in that they've obviously got that consistent look, mm. but then you are just placing an image, and it's why the image has to be so right. Yeah. Yeah. because the image completely speaks for what's mm -hmm. inside yeah it's 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 a, it's a really important it's my almost my favorite part of the production process is picking the covers <laughs> okay we're coming up to this present year this one oh yes inez holden there is no story there this is our second inez you didn't do the cover we did for blitz writing that was imperial war museum but this one i wanted something to do with propaganda and it was a very easy choice. It's and you said this is a really famous poster. It's a, yeah, it's a really famous. Um, you know, uh, come to the factories, imploring women to uh, you know get working in volunteer uh, working munition factories, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's it, it's a very very familiar image, and therefore, even if you don't quite know where it's from, it will sort of somewhere in your subconscious, yeah, um, speak to you know speak to you and you will understand what's vaguely that book is about yes and it's the second world war you got the planes you got the costume yeah, you've got yeah. the bright shining propaganda face yes. and you've got the factory at the back and all of that is true for the book because it's about a secret munitions factory in the north of england and an awful lot of women work there um there is a strap line on the original image saying women of England come to the factories or something yeah. like that and yeah. originally we had that strap line in but when I showed the, the rough of the cover to our sales reps um, in America they said drop the strap line it distracts from the title and in yeah. hindsight they're absolutely right I yeah. thought it made more sense to have the whole image but they were right cut it and I think that did the trick because the title We've got three. We've got the title. We've got the subtitle. Wartime writing because it's a it's the book, the novel, yeah. and the long form journalism. And then yeah, so it works really well. And the colours are beautiful. That cinnamon brown with the bright yellow of her hair. It's just a lovely, yes. lovely combination. Yeah. Yes, that was a good one too. All our covers are good. And then we have well, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> then we have yeah this is david another of wright. my favorites this is david wright painted by david wright yes. for margaret kennedy where stands a winged sentry which is margaret kennedy's journal her diaries of 1940 um so we have dunkirk we've got the blitz we've got the battle of britain we've got evacuation we've got bombing she's living in surrey with her children and she evacuates to coral mortis and dives and it's about what it was like. And she's constantly questioning. It's not a novel, it's a memoir, and, a, and a, a, it's sort of semi-dated, so you can sense the, the, the passage of time. Lots of conversations reported with friends and neighbors, observations, this is what happened when a bomber flies overhead, everyone scuttles away. Um, and it's really powerful because it's quite unlike any other wartime memoir I've read. So I wanted, her in the sense of a woman on the cover who was looking really quite questioning who wasn't being the brave little woman at home who wasn't being certainly wasn't being mrs miniver this is mrs miniver with the gloves off who was antagonistic and then you fished out david wright well um <laughs> just to give you know david wright started out working as uh, well he you know he, he was an illustrator and mm -hmm. he started out working on fashion magazines um providing covers for titles like home notes um the sort of 1930s women's fashion magazines and that in doing that he met his wife esme who was a model mm. and she was an absolute stunner we've got yeah. photographs of her what a beauty um and and what he did uh, he was commissioned by the sketch magazine um, and I think the first one was it 1940 or 41 anyway um, to do a series of pinups which were known as David Wright's lovelies <laughs> they were published every week in the sketch 
and they were pin-ups. They were designed to, you know, they were printed on slightly different glossy paper, designed to be torn out, and they were hugely popular. We know all about the American pin-up artists like Gil Elfrin and mm. whatnot, but David Wright was homegrown. Yeah. And he certainly sort of produced a slightly different pinup as well, a little bit more kind of, um, you know, elegant and sophisticated looking, not quite so pneumatic. Yeah. Anyway, they just uh, not so to wear many clothes. No, they didn't wear. Sometimes, well, that's quite interesting actually, because sometimes they were really quite risque. But the sketch mm. had always, you know, it was always um, of trying to appeal to quite a cosmopolitan, sophisticated readership. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of liked to think of itself as a bit Parisian in that <laughs> respect. Um, so some of them are quite like, whoa, that's quite saucy. And then another week, he'll just have a head and shoulders woman in a turban. I mean, really attractive, looking a bit seductive, mm -hmm. but she's fully clothed. And I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. Or somebody in a uniform. So yes. he did mix it up a bit. Mm -hmm. And this one, I can't remember what date this one was published, but it's called My Favourite Model, Mrs. Mm -hmm. David Wright. And it is of Esme. Now, lots of his pinups were based on Esme. He would get her to pose in wigs, but he'd also get uh, the wives and girlfriends of friends to pose. But this one is undoubtedly her. And if you yeah. look at photographs of her and yeah, she and now apparently they did have quite a tempestuous marriage and she went off and had affairs and things um there's poor old david at his easel you know oh. churning out these pinups and, and yeah. he's running amok um <laughs> but you can see that you can see she's absolutely no walkover mm. um she's got that you know one eyebrow raised yeah i think really how long have I got to stand here? And, and she's <laughs> in that, you know, fabulous, slightly masculine wartime out, which is just, oh, you know, yeah, she's wonderful. She looks sh chic, you know, self possessed, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, <clears throat> nobody's fool. No, and she's got painted nails, super, um, the, the makeup's gorgeous. Yeah. And she's got wartime dungarees and a beautiful, frivolous silk blouse, but short sleeved. Oh, she looks wa wonderful. And nothing like Margaret Kennedy, but that's not the point. It's questioning attitude. Um, and it also reflects the title because the title is um, A Little Outre, where stands a winged century. It's from a 18th century poem, which is much more well known, certainly in Kennedy's day, as a hymn. Um, so it would have been a phrase ah. you would have sung in church yeah. um, or heard it as an anthem. I think the anthem would have been played at like memorials and big state and sort of national events. And then you've got it with a, <laughs> a very beautiful glamour girl. Yeah. But it also means this is someone watching the Germans approach because that's what the book is about. It's about, we don't know what's gonna happen in this war. And I'm writing this, di this, this journal and I'm gonna send it to my friends in America to keep it safe because it's important that we have a record of what is going to happen or what had happened no matter what may happen in the future yeah. and the book was published in america in 1943 i think i've forgotten 42 43 and it kind of sank without trace and has never until now been published in britain so it's a lost kennedy that no one really knew about and i knew about it because i went to a conference about 10 years ago in America, and an academic there mentioned it in passing as in the subject of wartime memoirs. And I thought, oh, Margaret Kennedy, never heard of that. And it's a title you don't forget. So when I was having a meeting with the Curtis Brown um, heritage agent, she yeah. said, and we have this estate, and we have Margaret Kennedy's estate, and we have this amazing book, Where Stands a Winged Century. And I said, give it to me now. Yeah. And that's how we took it. And nobody knew about it. It's, um, well, well, you've sold it to me. I think this is the, the next one I'm going to order from you, actually. I, I really good. want to read it. So, <laughs> it is a great. beautiful book and it's done very well. <laughs> now, I've run out of props because we're now moving into the books we have not yet published because oh, yeah. we are printing them right now. So the next one is Rose Macaulay's Personal Pleasures, which is waiting to be printed. It will be printed in May. No, in June. Um, this is a collection of essays by Macaulay and came out in 1935. They're funny, they're witty, they're so scholarly and they're so light and effervescent and just delightful. And I wanted the cover to be something about pleasure and women. Now, in the land of digital books, book buying, that's a very dangerous combination. And we have published a book called Desire, which is 
just a nightmare to search for <laughs> online because you know what you're going to find and it's not going to be an Edwardian novel called Desire. Yeah. So yeah. I wanted something for personal pleasures that would take us away from that territory. And I think I found this one because you were going, oh, right, when I told you I wanted it, um, because I searched for women and pleasure. And I tried cars because quite a few of the essays have got to do with driving. And Rose McCauley was a notoriously terrible driver, but she loved it. And then we have this advert for petrol, which has this gorgeous 1930s woman at the wheel driving. And it's just beautiful. And that advert was published in Good Housekeeping. And I, you know, I mentioned I mentioned earlier um, about how you know, motoring advertisers were really aiming at women, particularly between yeah. the wars. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I love the fact that Pratt's motor oil, um, <laughs> uh, uh, that's what they're doing. You know, all right, we need an advert for the women's magazine market. Mm. Let's let's do this. And yeah. there's quite a lot of this sort of thing, you know, women looking very carefree behind the wheel. Mm. Um, which I guess is the kind of mood that you wanted to convey. Yeah, and, and Shell, I think Shell did a lot, a big series of adverts in the Windsor magazine, which featured very glamorous men and women in golfing kit or sailing yeah, yeah. kit or hiking kit with a very, very large car. And it was a petrol advert for Shell. And yeah. quite often the woman is driving, which surprises me. But yeah, you're right, yeah. there was a big thing about women encouraged to spend their money on a car and have freedom. Yeah. Um, because it was glamorous it was yeah. attractive maybe men got really interested in the idea of a woman controlling a big hearty male machine I don't know yeah it's you know upper class women obviously were clearly the first to 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 take you know be able to drive cars because they could afford them mm -hmm. but by this point you've got you know little hillmans and that sort of thing that people, yeah. yes mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah yeah uh, that people could afford Yep. And it was it was completely the thing to do. You know, you mentioned hiking, hiking, go, you know, tootling off to road houses. This mm. was all part of the glamorous. Yes, driving to go out and have fun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's nineteen uh, thirties are terrific for that kind of imagery. Yeah. The next and that, that 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 image actually comes from the uh, Land of Lost Content archive, which is oh, okay. yeah, which yeah. is Wayne Hemingway's um, mm -hmm. kind of design archive, which is. It came to us abysmally keyworded, yeah. unfortunately, which means sometimes only you know things only occasionally get found. With, <laughs> and there's so much, it's very difficult. But it is it's a treasure trove. It's fabulous, marvelous. Okay, yeah. well, I may I may well be dipping into it in the future without yeah. realizing. The next book is um, Eleanor Mordaunt, The Villa and the Vortex, which is a collection of supernatural and weird short stories by a completely forgotten woman author who we published in Women's Weird, which we brought out in 2019. Yeah, and yeah. This is a collection of all of, of the best of her stuff. And there were many, many choices because I looked and looked and I pulled out about 15 different images, all would have done fine. And I couldn't decide. And Melissa, the editor also couldn't decide. So we did, I decided we're gonna crowdsource opinions. So I put a shout out on Twitter saying, if anybody wants to contribute to our choosing, send me your email address and I will send you the PDF with all the, the, the roughs. So we had about nine people voting on the picture they liked best for the cover. And the one they chose is this Edwardian image from a Wagnerian opera, Yeah, which is the yeah. image I like the least. I mean, it's, it's a good image, but I don't really like it. But, you know, I'm going with what the popular opinion is. And our sales reps love it. Clearly, they know something I do or they have better. Yeah. Taste. I mean, it's it's kind of not. It seems a little more um, typical, I think, than the usual choices. Almost, it's a little. It's maybe a little more obvious. Um, maybe, yeah, yeah. But like you I said, going, it works. Yeah, I was it going works. for the the black and white photographs of a spooky lane leading off into a distant, broken down mill. I wanted that atmospheric, but no, the others didn't have it. Didn't like them. They wanted this. So, oh well. Yeah, the stories will will certainly, I mean, it, it reflects at least two of the stories in the collection, coincidentally. So that's another strong reason. For I think it's interesting it. that people chose um, an illustration or a painting mm. as above a photograph. Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? But OK, we'll see how it goes. This is yeah. a, our yeah. September title. The next title is Marjorie Grant, Latchkey Ladies. Now we're bringing this out in March 2022. 
Um, this is another novel that I've rediscovered, although I was helped considerably because uh, Sarah Le Panu, who is um, the biographer of Rose Macaulay and also wrote a memoir of her researches into Rose Macaulay, which we're bringing out in July, oh, that's okay. Dreaming of Rose. In Dreaming of Rose, Sarah discovers that Marjorie Grant Cook, who was one of Rose Macaulay's oldest friends and also very close friends with the family of Ma Rose Macaulay's lover, Gerald O'Donovan, she was an author. Not only did she review incessantly, prolifically for the Times Literary Supplement, she wrote seven novels of her own. So the first novel, which Sarah talked about in her memoir, I thought had to be discovered because um, it's about pregnancy and it was published in 1921. So you've got a young woman having an out of, out of wedlock pregnancy and she's an educated woman, she's a teacher. And this is a really unusual subject and how did it get published? Yeah. So I read the novel and thought, oh yes, this is very good. So I wanted a cover that was an independent woman but it had to be early 1920s. And you found me this shopping scene, which is yeah, beautiful. Yeah, you know, this picture, um, uh, the ILN archive, which is housed and managed at Mary Evans, mm -hmm. consists of the some of the magazines I've already mentioned, Tatler, Bystander Sketch, and The Sphere. And this picture comes from The Sphere. And I just love the fact that these magazines published illustrations and pictures for the sake of it, because yeah. that's what people expected and enjoyed. And it gave so much work to these illustrators who were all so talented. This is an artist called Miller Watt, who did quite a lot for these mm -hmm. sort of magazines that are hardly known nowadays. I just... I found this quite late in the day, this picture. You know, I continue to find. I mean, we've got <laughs> yeah. hundreds of thousands of pages. You know, I mean, it, you know, it's just volume after volume. It's, it's extensive. But mm. I continue to still find things I've never seen before. So it's probably a couple of years ago now. But I found this one. That is absolutely beautiful. I love the light. I love kind of the, you know, the bustle. I mm. loved, um, you know, it really, even though they were there in their 1920s clothes, I love the fact that, oh, yeah, this is like being, you know, just going to the shops around Piccadilly Circus as the lights fading in yeah. late November. And you're looking in the windows. Oh, look at that. And then yeah, and it, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. And, you know, they're dressed up in, it's not, you know, when people think of the 20s, they all think of flapper dresses and mm. they're, they're just in their coats. Um, it's very kind of true to life. Yeah. But there's a couple also of beautiful right? colours and, mm. you know. And she's holding a big bunch of flowers. She's her yes. face is lit up yeah. with happiness, with expectation, with joy in her her condition. She's a happy woman, and this is what the book's about and how things change. And I'm yeah, she's sort it. of there as a figure at the front, isn't she? While yeah. things are almost going on around her, it's mm, uh, mm. it's a lovely picture. Again, I'm really pleased yeah. that you found a way to use that. The, the sales reps are enjoying this picture a lot, which is good. good. Yeah. Good, good, good. The next picture, um, Helen Simpson, The Outcast and the Right, which we're bringing out May 2022. This is another collection of supernatural short fiction by a woman who's pretty much been forgotten. Now, this has a Margaret Kennedy connection because in Where Stands a Winged Century, Margaret Kennedy is looking after not only her own three children, but a young girl who is the daughter of very close friends of the family because the mother is dying of cancer. And the mother does die of cancer. So Clemence, who is the young girl, stays with the Kennedys and then she's a family friend. And um, Helen Simpson was the woman who died. She was an Australian novelist. She was of Huguenot descent. She married a, a distinguished um, surgeon uh, whose name was Simpson. And she herself wrote short fiction, but somehow it never took. She sh sold short stories. She wrote novels, some were good. She wrote plays. And that's presumably how she met Margaret Kennedy because they were writing at the same time in London. And then she died of cancer very early in her life, uh, 1940. So we republished one of the short stories in Women's Weird 2. And I, that, that story, I love to bits. It's about a young girl discovering that she has witchcraft powers and it's, it's so scary. And Melissa put together this collection and we realized that the collection is all about stories about landscape, about how landscape and nature interact with the human to produce blind terror in various degrees of it. So we wanted a picture of a woman outdoors, not necessarily in a position of vulnerability, like so many ghastly thrillers are, 
but in the sense of this is a spooky situation. And then you found us this beautiful, beautiful graphic design or this, this illustration of a ghostly figure in a in a woodland setting. A woodland. It's, it's, it's French, isn't it? It's, it's, it uh, is, and I know nothing about it. You know, it's one of those uh, pictures which comes from a French magazine. I know nothing about the magazine, mm -hmm. uh, Coco Rico and all the artists, Louis Popineau, but mm -hmm. it's another, it's from 1900 again, and it's still, it's, it, again, it's got that really strong contrasting yeah. poster graphic style. Yeah, um, which I find really attractive. Yeah. So, um, in a way, it's, it's quite like the much more modern clear style that the Hergé and the other uh, cartoonists yeah, in the 50s is. and 60s would have used, with a very, yeah. very clear outline. And uh, Nadja did some very clever trickery pokery with the face. I think in the original, there may have been a very faint face sketched in, features, but she removed that. So it's a blank white face, very clever. No feature, which yeah, I yeah. think accentuates the, um, the uncanniness of yeah. this very strange landscape. It's, no, the colors are beautiful in this one. I love those greens, yeah. And then we have two more. We have V.K. Broster, From the Abyss. Yeah. Another collection of short supernatural by a woman who is actually very well known. When I was growing up, V.K. Broster was, she was like Jean Plady. She was like Nigel Tranter. She wrote historical fiction about the 45 in Scotland and other historical events. Mm. But she was a historical novelist your granny had on her shelves and yeah, you know yeah. she was part of the wallpaper i had no idea that she wrote supernatural short fiction until melissa evanson put one of her stories into women's weird um couching on the floor which is about a, a feather boa that comes back to do dreadful things to the man who abandoned the owner of the boa um <laughs> it's pretty bad wow <laughs> so we have this really strange collection of supernatural short stories but finding an image to encapsulate the whole was hard and in the end I just went for women look w pictures of women 1920s because that's yeah. all I could think of and then we got this extraordinary picture of a woman in the black black fur and the stonking great jewels and the cloche hat and her face and the looks, cigarette yeah it's um it's by I mean it, it's I love the story of this artist. It's an artist called Gordon Conway, mm -hmm. who was, it, despite being called Gordon, was a woman. And she was, came from, tech. she was a Texan. Wow, I had no idea she was a woman. Oh, yeah. that's even better. Oh, yeah. wow, great. Um, she was, she, she was a, a, a fashion designer mm -hmm. and a costume designer. And she came to London um, in the sort of late 1920s, designed for a lot of stage shows, and at the same time was providing illustrations for various magazines, Eve magazine, then Britannia and Eve, and also mm -hmm. the Tatler. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes she might just do, an you know, like I said, the, these magazines just wanted illustration yeah. and they were, re they really celebrated 1920s, you know, modern 1920s mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. And she had this very stylized look about her women with these almond eyes and, you know, thin noses and thin yeah. lips and just very stylish and their cloche hats. And this picture is just an absolute stunner, isn't it? It you is. Know? Um, it's, I think it's been used for a greetings card before. Oh, and really? actually um, I, I, did a little curation of a wall of her images at the mm -hmm. Fashion and Textile Museum. They did um, a oh. beautiful um, Jazz Age fashion exhibition a few years ago, mm -hmm. and they they did a lovely uh, Gordon Conway. Display. Oh gosh, Ooh. yeah. And she, you know, she and I think she set up one of the first um, fashion studios for, for. I'm sorry, fashion sort of uh, costume departments at a film studio when she, when she went back to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, she had red hair, she, you know, cropped, short, she, a lot of publicity photographs um, where she always um, posed with her cat. Oh, my word. Um, she sounds a character. Yeah, Someone she, she, really she definitely for. was. Uh, there's mm. a fabulous book about her, actually, um, written by a professor, in, maybe at the University of Texas, actually. OK. Um, so, yeah, she's a very interesting character. Died quite young, unfortunately. Uh huh. Right. I think she died of something like a heart attack and, you know, overwork, probably. Mm. Wow. OK, well, it's to us all. <laughs> God, no. But, well, the image, yeah, she, when, I, when, yeah. when I showed Melissa the image, she went, it's that one. That's the one we want because it's got the black fur, which relates directly to coaching at the, the door. The feather, yeah. The yeah. yeah. So again, a perfect match. 
Great. And now we have our last cover, which is John Llewellyn Rees, um, England is my village and the flying shadow. This comes out November 2022. And it's the most recent one we uh, sort of set up. It's again, a forgotten novel, but not by a woman. This man was an RAF pilot and he died in a training accident just before the Battle of Britain. Oh. He was in a bomber and the nice. trainee he was piloting and the plane crashed, killing three perfectly good airmen. Wow. Um, so he died very young. He'd already published two novels and this collection, England is my village, he was writing short stories and bits and pieces and his widow, who was Jane Oliver, who wrote Business as Usual. Wow. Oh, OK. And that's how I discovered him. Yeah. So she put together this last collection, which he'd been planning. So she was following what she knew he wanted. And it came out in the next year. It won the Hawthorne Den Prize, oh, which right. was a, a now defunct literary prize for excellence in writing. Graham Greene had won it the year before. Major names won this prize. And John Llewellyn Rees has completely disappeared into oblivion. Um, there was a literary prize set up. Jane Oliver and Anne Stafford set up the John Llewellyn Rees Prize for young Commonwealth writers funded by her own royalties. And that lasted with various sponsors until the 1980s, I think. I think it's, it's long stopped. And I know that Jane Oliver's nephew, who is her literary estate owner, he would be very keen to get it revived, but there's no money because her royalties have gone a long time ago. Anyway, mm. so I read, I got the two books that the London Library had because he is really unobtainable. London Library, thank goodness, had them so I could get them posted, read them, and I I, I missed my bedtime. You know, I couldn't stop reading these fabulous books. I gave them to my husband, and he was halfway through and said, oh, yes, yes, we are definitely publishing these. So um, he's out of copyright, so we can bring them out, but I'm in touch with the family, and they're very pleased. It's about, the, both the books are 1930s aviation and also a couple of Second World War aviation stories, but it's about the culture of aviation as well as the visceral experience of flying yeah, yeah. a box of canvas and metal into the air and then knowing what to do when you've got it up there, 30,000 yeah, yeah. feet. So I needed a flight image. Um, I'm very conscious this book is going to appeal to men a lot more than many of our books do, but I wanted the glamour. And then you gave me the bystander, the cover yeah, of the yeah. bystander. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I keep coming back to these magazines, but they were utterly, you know, of their time, really wanting to um, champion, cover, celebrate these kind of new modern activities that people are uh, indulging in. And aviation was it, you know, it's like mm. the pinnacle, really. It wasn't was it? huge. Uh, yeah. You know, all, all members of high society were all hanging out at Brooklands and Heston and all mm. going off in planes and sometimes getting killed, um, which, which, you know, they, that is what happened. So yeah. there was and the, book, the books do not shy away from this. Yeah. No. Um, and the bystander was so invested in it, it brought out a flying number every year. That's extraordinary. Every year, it was a flying yeah, number. Well, you know, I can't, I'm not quite sure from where, well, certainly up to the Second World War, probably yeah. from around, um, 19, you know, for the third, during the 1930s. Yeah, yeah. Um, and had these wonderful covers designed mm, uh, to celebrate mm. it. I mean, you know, it also did um, a Riviera every number of yes. years and a winter <laughs> sports number. So yes. when you get round to publishing a novel about one of those subjects, you know, we'll, we'll have <laughs> I know where to come. It's true. Um, but that particular image that you chose as being a real winner, and it, we, we found it and scanned it quite a few years ago. It's mm -hmm. been used on cards and things. You know, it's you know, it's just superb, isn't it? Yeah, it's it. Yeah, Nadja positioned the cover with the bystander slightly at an angle and with the the shilling price in the corner, just to see as an experiment because she yeah. gives me a PDF with various versions and variations, and this one just jumped out at me because I said, no, that's it because it's it's not just this illustrates the glamour of flying, it shows you it's a front, it's an image, it's a constructed image, yes. and you have to go further and see exactly what this is about. And this is what the books are about too, yeah. getting past the glamour. And let's think about the smell of petrol, what happens if you panic when you're up there and how can your instructor get you down? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a superb... Mind you, the two people in that plane are you. Yeah, I know, I know. They're not going to last much longer. <laughs> no, they're not. You don't wave like... You'd lose your arm if you put your arm out like that at the speed you're flying. But um, I bet the author of England is My Village will have read The Bystander. I am sure he would. And for all we know, he could have been... His earlier books could have been reviewed in The Bystander. Yeah, yeah well, that's I'm, worth worth looking up, actually. Is, yeah, to look for reviews. I wouldn't be surprised. Or, yeah. you know, he may have written on aviation or anything like that. That is... Mm. Mm. yeah it was a culture it was yeah and I think he was apparently a very dashing um exemplar of that culture right yeah. wow well, that's and with sad. that I think we have come to the end of a really quite long conversation but it, uh, yes <laughs> we've used a lot of pictures on covers which I'm very proud of so many pictures and so many fabulous books Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for watching and I hope you've enjoyed it. You know where to find us, pantelpress.co.uk and Mary Evans Picture Library is Mary, is it maryevans.com? Maryevans.com, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have a rummage, enjoy the show.